What would you do if you watched someone you loved kill somebody? Well, actually, let's take that a step further. What would you do if the person they killed was someone you wanted to be with? Now, this teenage love story doesn't end with true love's first kiss. Instead, it ends in death, fire, and dismemberment. They thought they could get away with killing one of their classmates. In the end, guilt triumphed over love. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. I'm Amy, and if you're looking for all the crime in half the time, you found it. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss a story. Now, let's recap. Seventeen-year-old Corey Gregory found himself at the center of a girl fight on a cold January day in 2005. He was in the back seat of his friend's car as two girls began pulling each other's hair and fighting over him. The fight escalated until one of the girls overpowered the other and choked her to death. The killer, 16-year-old Sarah Kolb, was Corey's ex-girlfriend. They were still very close. He loved her more than anything. The dead girl was 16-year-old Adrian Reynolds, who was just trying to make new friends in a new town. She'd fallen for Corey, but she'd also sort of fallen for Sarah. Their strange love triangle boiled over in a Taco Bell parking lot on January 21st, 2005. Adrian had already lost her life. Sarah and Corey were about to throw theirs away. They were self-proclaimed juggalos and juggalettes, aka devout fans of the band Insane Clown Posse. But the hormones crept in and soon all they could think about was sex. Who was having it? Who were they having it with? Who would have it with them? Did jealousy push this teenager to kill someone she called a friend? Or did a long history of anger management issues finally pushed her over the edge. Adrian Reynolds was born on September 12, 1988 in the small city of El Dorado, Arkansas. Her mother, Carolyn Franco, was only 16. Adrian was legally adopted by her grandmother and her then-husband, Tony Reynolds. They cared for baby Adrian until her mother could get on her feet. Carolyn landed a convenience store gig in Kilgore, Texas. Adrian moved back in with mom. She was an outgoing girl who loved to talk and sing. She dreamed of being on America an idol one day. Adrian may have focused too much on singing. School was more of an afterthought. When she was 12, she needed an emergency appendectomy. The surgery caused her to fall behind even further. According to her birth mother, Adrian began hanging around a what she called druggy crowd. Carolyn was worried for her daughter's safety. So in November 2005, she sent Adrian to live with Tony and Joanne Reynolds. They quickly became mom and dad. Adrian moved to East Moline, a small city in northwestern Illinois. Going to a four-year high school wasn't going to work anymore, so the plan shifted. Adrian would attend Black Hawk College Outreach, an alternative school in East Moline. It was home to only about 80 students, all of whom needed a unique approach to education. The goal was get her GED, join the Marines. American Idol would have to wait. At Black Hawk, Adrian met Sarah Kolb and Corey Gregory. Sarah was the popular girl. She was known for her love of heavy metal music and her hair trigger temper. Corey was like a puppy dog that followed Sarah everywhere she went. Sarah and Corey met at the mall. They snuck around back and smoked weed behind a department store and were attached to the hip every day after. Before he met Sarah, Corey was a fun-loving kid and a straight-A student. Then, during his sophomore year, he fell in love with weed in St. Clown posse and Sarah Kolb. She wore baggy pants and black band t-shirts. She gave off that kind of hot, I don't give a damn what anybody thinks vibe. You know the one. So she and Corey dated for a few weeks, but she broke things off. They agreed to just be friends. Corey always wanted more. He was so infatuated with her that he transferred to Black Hawk. He learned that Sarah had a reputation for being the angry girl in school. In her journal, she wrote, it seems as if everyone is driving me crazy and all I want to do is slaughter them like the effing sheep they are. Corey's parents were getting a little worse about his obsession over Sarah. He wanted them to be boyfriend, girlfriend. And in his mind, that whole stalk them until they give in thing, that's kind of where he was going. If he hung around long enough as a best friend, Sarah would eventually see him as a boyfriend. He was loyal to the bitter end. There are a few differing accounts of how the three friends came together. Some say Adrian became instantly popular at Black Hawk. She was friendly with everyone, including Sarah and Corey, and she was pretty. Others say Adrian changed her entire persona to make Sarah like her. She she ditched pop and hip-hop music for heavy metal. She started wearing all black and calling herself a juggalo. Some believe Corey first met Adrian and pulled her into the group, possibly to make Sarah jealous. That was his plan. It backfired. Sarah liked Adrian. Like, she like liked Adrian. So they began passing notes in class. Innocent at first, but then more sexual. Adrian asked if Sarah was bi or a straight lesbian. What's the most you've done with a girl? One of her notes read. Things turned sour between the girls at a party one day. Adrian began flirting with other boys. She's causing Sarah to get 
real jealous. When Adrian allegedly had sex with one of those boys, Sarah lost it. She began calling Adrian names like slut, whore. When Adrian tried to call and talk to her friend, Sarah would yell and hang up on her. According to Corey, the girls fought every single day after that party. Adrian kept writing letters, but she got no response. If they talked at school, it usually decayed into a screaming match. At one point, Adrian feared for her life. She told her mother, Joanne, that she was scared of Sarah. She'd yell at her all the time, saying things like, you should kill yourself. Still, Adrian wasn't ready to let go. She kept writing to Sarah, saying, I wanted a chance for us to start over again and be friends, at least. Another letter asked, why do you hate me so much? Why do you want me to die? In mid-January 2005, things got even more complicated. Adrian and Corey began hooking up. They'd hang out behind Sarah's back because they were really worried about how angered she was going to be if she ever found out. But Sarah did eventually find out. She was furious at first, but she quickly forgave Corey. Adrian on the other hand, was dead to her. In her journal, Sarah wrote, stupid bitch needs to back up off my Kool-Aid. She's gonna give him a note? Yeah, well, I'll effing kill her. That same day, January 21st, 2005, as the story goes, Sarah and Adrian agreed to squash their beef over lunch at Taco Bell. Corey met up with them along with another boy named Sean. So while they're sitting in Sarah's car, the two girls begin fighting and hitting each other. Sean bolts. Corey just sits there. He doesn't know what to do. What happened next depends on whose story you believe. According to Corey, Sarah attacked Adrian with a stick she kept in the car for protection. The fight moved into the back seat. Sarah overpowered Adrian and she strangled her with a belt until she stopped moving. And she and Corey sit there smoking cigarettes, waiting for Adrian to wake up, which she never does. Her face is blue, her lips are cold, she's dead. Now, Sarah's story starts the same way, but this time, Corey is the one who initiates the attack. He says something along the lines of, she's not one of us. Then he strangles Adrian to death with his belt. Sarah claims Corey threatened to kill her, her family, her cats, if she didn't help him cover it up. Meanwhile, Corey says it was Sarah's idea to hide the body. He simply loved her so much he couldn't say no. From this point forward, Sarah and Corey tell the same story. They drive to a farm owned by Sarah's grandparents. Plan A is wrap Adrian's body in a tarp and bury it. There's just one problem. The ground is frozen stiff, so they move on to plan B. Corey douses Adrian's body in gasoline and lights it on fire. They assume it's going to burn like a cremation furnace, but they're wrong. Adrian didn't crumble to ashes, so they move on to plan C. Sarah says they needed to get Adrian's body off this land ASAP. Cutting her to pieces was the only option. But lucky for Sarah and Corey, they know another boy who'd happily butcher Adrian's corpse. Nate Gaudet was a 16-year-old Black Hawk student who loved blood and gore. Like, loved it. People at school knew him as the kid who'd go around killing animals for fun. The next day, Sarah and Corey pick up Nate and they drive him to the farm. According to Corey, Nate doesn't hesitate. He grabs a saw, he starts chopping Adrian to bits. He cuts off her arms, her legs, her head, then he saws her torso in half. Corey said it was worse than any horror movie you could watch, and he and Sarah talked about anything they could to take their minds off of what was happening in front of them. Then Corey held a trash bag open while Nate dropped the pieces inside. They load the bag into Sarah's car, but before disposing of it, they stop at a McDonald's for lunch. Nothing like a box of chicken nuggets to get murder off your mind. From McDonald's, they drive to the Black Hawk Historic Site in Rock Island, Illinois. It's a state park located on a 150-foot bluff overlooking the Rock River. Our trio scoured the woods for a place to bury Adrian's remains. Sarah eventually found a spot and told the boys to start digging. Meanwhile, Adrian's parents are worried sick. She hasn't shown up for her shift at Checkers, a fast food restaurant in town. They called the police to report her missing. Now, the cops believed Adrian was a runaway, but that didn't make sense to Joanne and Tony because she didn't pack any things. She didn't even pick up her paycheck from work. Now, other friends from school told police that Adrian went with Sarah and Corey to Taco Bell the day she went missing. So they tracked Sarah down, who already had a lie ready. According to Sarah, she dropped Adrian off around noon and never saw her again. Meanwhile, Corey was starting to crack. He was so guilt-stricken that he told his parents they needed a lawyer. His mother said, Corey, if you haven't done anything wrong, you know, you don't have anything to worry about. Corey's dad wasn't about to let it go at that. He could tell his son was hiding something. So he starts asking Corey questions about Adrian. He asks, did something happen to her in the car? Corey nods his head. Did she get hurt in the car? Corey nods again, like talking to Lassie. His father braced for the hardest question he'd ever ask. Is she dead? 
Corey nods yes. So he agrees to tell the police everything. Four days after the murder, he led them down a steep, icy path in Black Hawk State Park. Police found the bag containing Adrian's body parts trapped under a manhole cover and buried beneath a pile of dirt. Sarah, Corey, and Nate are promptly arrested. Nate, being a juvenile, was sentenced to five years in prison. He was released in November 2008, but died in a car accident in April 2012. Now, Sarah and Corey were tried as adults, both charged with first-degree murder. Sarah took the witness stand and tried to blame everything on Corey. Apparently, it was enough to convince one juror that she didn't do it, so a hung jury resulted in a mistrial. She didn't get as lucky at her second trial, though. She was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to over 50 years in prison. Corey pleaded guilty and was sentenced to over 40 years in prison. Today, Corey identifies as a transgender woman and goes by the name Harley Quinn. In her memory, Adrian's family began the Adrian Lee Reynolds Memorial Fund. The goal is to help kids take the GED who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it. By 2010, the fund had already helped 66 local students take and pass the GED. It's always great when something good comes out of something bad, but damn, that was really bad. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.